Welcome to our sharing on the book of Exodus. Uh, we now begin the final section of this uh, wonderful book, and it covers chapters 25 to 40. This is the longest section of the book of Exodus. We've had great drama before now, and what follows is not great drama, but extremely important development. There are two parts in the second half of the book of Exodus. One is chapters 32 to 34, which we've already done. That dealt with the apostasy and recovery of the people uh, of Israel. And the rest of it between chapters 25 and 40 is all about the Mishkan or the tabernacle. Now, if it's all about the Mishkan or the tabernacle, then what we're being told is that everything that happened in the book of Exodus led to this point. This is it. This is what God actually wanted. If you remember Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, God said to Moses at the burning bush, after you have led the people out of Egypt, you are to offer worship to God on this mountain. So you're doing that for the sake of this. This has to happen for you to be able to do this. So the whole issue in the book of Exodus was about worshipping God correctly on the earth. Why would that be important? It's important because the whole earth was covered in false worship and false uh, idols and idolatry and the terrible uh, behaviour that actually went with it. So God wanted to teach the human race how to relate to him correctly and only he could do it because he alone knew the way. So uh, we find this e even reflected, I mean what I'm going to do now, there's such a commentary in the book of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament uh, and also in the book of Leviticus that it's actually quite difficult to stay within the one chapter uh, of Exodus. But if you go to the conversation that Jesus had with the woman of Samaria in uh, chapter John chapter 4, uh, you find that he was putting a correction into the system. And he was telling her that, you know, all this debate and struggle between whether Jerusalem was right or Mount Gerizim was right, or nowadays whether Catholics are right or Protestants are right or any other religion is right, he said, it's all obsolete. In the future, he said, and this is what he was inaugurating, those who will worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. Only God can teach us how to worship in spirit and in truth. Nobody else can do that. So the, what was the issue there? The issue there was that Jesus was saying, only God can teach us how to worship him correctly. Nobody else can do it. Uh, the amazing thing is that no other subject in the Bible gets as much attention as the tabernacle in Exodus. And the Holy Spirit, who happens to be the author of Scripture, obviously considered the dwelling place of God on earth to be the most vital thing that needed to happen. How could God actually uh, come and live upon the earth among his people when they had not yet been redeemed, because uh, that was in the future through Christ. And how could he set up a system in which they could in fact relate to him and they could in fact grow spiritually as well. If you take, for example, the creation of the world, which of course we consider absolutely vital, otherwise we wouldn't be here. It's only given two chapters in the book of Genesis, but the information about the tabernacle is given 10 chapters in the book of Exodus, which means it is five times more important in God's eyes, which is amazing. So when you reflect on Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9, it certainly shows us that God's way of thinking is as different from ours as the heavens are from the earth. So I'm going to be talking all the time uh, in this uh, episode on introducing the whole idea of the tabernacle. You must remember that the New Testament reflects on the Old and fulfills the Old, and the Old Testament prepares for the New. Why is that? 
because God lives outside of time and space. And God had one plan in his mind after the fall of Adam, and it's given in Genesis 3.15, and that is that he would send a saviour. So everything in the word of God is leading up to this point of the incarnation of the word. That is the high point. So everything is leading in that direction. And so I'm going to show you what may be utterly amazing to you is that everything about the tabernacle revealed something about the Christ. So we have to remember that St. Paul told us in 2 uh, Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired by God. It can profitably be used for teaching, for refuting error, for guiding people's lives and for teaching them to be holy. And St. Paul said in Romans 15.4 that all scripture is written for our learning. So the 10 chapters in Exodus about the tabernacle are not given to us simply as something that you can throw aside. So many people say, well, it's only the Old Testament, it doesn't mean anything. Well, when I'm finished with you, you'll realize just how much it means and how much we are neglecting the Word of God by not actually going to it and looking at it in detail. Everything written in the Exodus about the Mishkan or the tabernacle is very important because everything in the Old Testament is, uh, makes types and symbols of what is to come in the New. Now, the letter to the Hebrews keeps on referring to that all the time. Go to uh, chapter 10, verse 1, for example, that was what you have in the Old Testament are shadows of what was to be given to us in the New Testament. So. We are the ones who have the glorious privilege of God living among us, and I don't think we appreciate it fully. So, first I want to give you the fact that there are three meanings or ways of looking at the tabernacle. One is that it is a visible demonstration of that heavenly place where God lives, which we call heaven. This is Hebrews 10.1, only a shadow of the good things that come, but not the reality themselves. So everything we're going to look at in the tabernacle is pointing to the realities to Christ. The tabernacle was revealed by God to Moses. Now, once you get the revealed by God to Moses, you get the big key. Only God doesn't have a model. If you have a model, it's something outside of you. God only has himself as the reality, as the truth, ab eternal. That is from all eternity. And so if he reveals something, he's revealing something of himself and of the reality of his being. And so he's actually telling us something extraordinary, which I will go into uh, as we go along. So. In giving us the Mishkan, he's telling us something about heaven because that's where he lives. So with God, there's no past and there's no future. He's outside of time and space. Everything is present now. So the giving of the tabernacle or the Mishkan and the coming of the incarnate word was step one and step two, one prepared for the other. But the big event was the uh, coming of the Incarnate Word. And so it can be difficult for us to realize that because we're locked up in the time-space continuum and we think of yesterday and tomorrow. And we think that there's a vast amount of time between the setting up of the Mishkan and the actual coming of Christ. Okay, so it was a visible demonstration of heavenly realities is the first thing. And I'll illustrate that for you. It is a prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, the beating place between God and the human race. And Jesus himself, everything is through him, with him and in him. He is the meeting place between God and man. So everything in the tabernacle points to something in him. What is given here could only be fulfilled at the time of Christ. That's why Hebrews 10, 5 says, but when Christ came into the world, 
then everything was going to be a reality. Finally, it is actually a type of Christ in the church and the community uh, of the believers that belong to him. So let's look at the first one. The first uh, illustration is that it's a bit of heaven. This might surprise you, but if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 11 and verse 9, you read, The sanctuary of God in heaven opened, and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen inside of it. I'm going to be describing that for you. That is the Mishkan. It is the sanctuary of God on earth, and if you managed to get into it, or if it opened up, then what was inside would be seen. Now, at the point of the death of Jesus, you're told that the veil of the temple rent in two from top to bottom, so for the first time, anybody in the temple could see into the Holy of Holies. So the sanctuary of God was revealed. When you go to Revelation chapters 4 and 5, you get a very good description of what heaven is actually like and the sanctuary of God in heaven. Here you have Revelation chapter 4. After this, John said, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Now remember the door, the opening, because there's going to be only one door to the tabernacle. There was a door. And the voice I heard speaking to me said, come up here and I will show you what must take place. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. That throne we're going to find out is on the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary on earth. Now he saw the heavenly one. The earthly one is simply a reflection of what is in heaven. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald circled the throne and surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were the 24 elders which are usually understood as the 24 classes of priesthood. So you're getting a description of a throne, a sanctuary, and the uh, priesthood, and then the people outside. So you can read the rest of that yourself. And you find that the congregation that is present are singing the praises of God. So you have what we would call a church scene. So that's Revelation chapter four and five. And then you get Another revelation of heaven in Revelation 15, verses 1 to 4. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. That is this sanctuary around God's throne. And standing beside the sea, those who had proved victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. And they had harps and they were praising God. Okay. So again, you have the throne of God, you have this sanctuary, and you have people around the throne worshipping God. And the final fulfillment of the tabernacle that we're going to be talking about now is actually in the book of Revelation in chapters 21 and 22, which is the New Jerusalem. And I will refer to that uh, a number of times again, so I won't go into it now. So we get glimpses from the scriptures. Yes, there is a sanctuary in heaven. Yes, there is an order of worship. And so when God revealed this to Moses on the mountain, he had to put it into language that the people at the time would understand. They wouldn't understand what I've just read to you about the book of Revelation and all of that, because that was all in the future. So he had to give, give it to them in language they understood. If you're teaching a small child, uh, there's no point in giving them trigonometry or astrophysics. They're not ready for that. They're ready for some steps that will lead them to the next step and the next step and the next step. And maybe in the future, they will come to the astrophysics. And this is exactly how you have it in the Bible as well, that God has to give things step by step until when the final thing is actually revealed, you're able to understand it. And if you go to Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, uh, you're told something about what they learned about entering into the presence of God. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? Now, the holy place 
is actually the place where the priests operate. It's not where the congregation is. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, I'm going to show you as I describe the tabernacle for you, that the very first thing that had to be done was cleansing. So there's a big laver, a washing place out in the outer court. They have to have clean hands and a pure heart because the real cleaning is done in the heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol, in other words, you don't break the first commandment, or swear by what is fault, he will receive the blessing of the Lord and the vindication of God his Saviour. So the psalm there is simply expressing what they're going to learn from even the structure of the tabernacle teaches them how to approach God. So the second thing I said was that it was a prophetic forecast of the coming of the incarnation of the divine word to become incarnate. And when you go to the Gospel of St. John, he tells you, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so on. And then you jump down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word tabernacled among them. Now you're going to hear quite a bit about that. John uses the word tabernacled. It's just that our translations don't do that. Our translations simply say, He lived among us. But when John said, he tabernacled among us. He was referring to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that is actually very, very important. The tabernacle uh, originated in the mind of God, ab eterno, and he got Moses to build it for him under his instructions. And we're going to hear that at least seven or eight times the text reminds us you have to do it exactly as was given on the mountain. You have to follow the pattern that's on the mountain. You have to obey God absolutely. And the most wonderful thing you're going to hear in chapter 39 at the end of the story is that they obeyed him to the letter. That meant that that tabernacle was actually what God wanted. In the same way, I'm going to give you sort of what happened in the tabernacle and the fulfillment in Christ all the time, all the time, one after the other. The incarnation of the Word, which the tabernacle pointed to, was also in the mind of God, Ab Eterno, before uh, his mother gave him a body in the incarnation. The third meaning of the tabernacle is that it was called a tent of meeting. This is very important, a tent of meeting. A tent of meeting was a place where people would congregate together. If you needed to have a social gathering or a family gathering or some special event, then you had this tent of meeting. So the tabernacle was called a tent of meeting because it was the place where the congregation would come to meet God and God would come to meet the congregation. So it was there in this tent of meeting that divine commerce took place, heavenly business. And it was in the tent of meeting that God manifested himself. We'll deal with this as we go along, but you already know it from the early chapters as light and fire and cloud. And so these symbols point to him as awesomely holy and untouchably pure. This was the reality of his divine being. That's why a sinner couldn't come close to that you would be touched by that fire which would destroy you. That awesome holiness of God is something that our modern world seems to have forgotten altogether and therefore falls into a lot of sin which makes it impossible for them to actually come close to God. But I'll show you that in the whole structure of the tabernacle, you are shown the way to come back and to approach God. So in their dealings with God, they discovered that God is just about sin. You'll find exactly the same thing in the Gospel. That if you repent of your sins, God will show you 
incredible mercy. He won't tolerate the sin, but he has huge mercy on the sinner. And you have to separate them. That's why there's going to be all of this sacrificial system uh, to negotiate coming back to God. The whole plan was to bring the chosen people into communion with God himself. And that's why there were various types of offerings and sacrifices actually made in the tabernacle. Of course, in the New Testament, this is all fulfilled in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. When you read uh, Revelation 21, verse 3, where the whole thing has been achieved in the book of Revelation, because it's the very end of the Bible, you're told, here God lives among men or humanity. He will make his home among them. They will be his people and he will be their God. And his name is Emmanuel, God with us. So what he started here in the tabernacle in the wilderness is actually achieved fully in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21. So everything about the tabernacle then foreshadows Jesus and tells us something about his person and about his work. As the letter to the Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 says, we have a high priest uh, of exactly the kind that is needed. He has his place at the right hand of the throne of the divine majesty in heaven. Now, when you go to the book of Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the only one, the only person who can cross the sea of glass to the actual throne of God is the Lamb who was sacrificed, whom we discover is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So he takes his place at the right of the throne of the Divine Majesty in the heavens, and he is the minister of the sanctuary and of the tent of meeting which the Lord and not man has set up. You see, the, the, the letter to the Hebrews is commenting quite a bit on the tabernacle. So each aspect of the tabernacle, therefore, points to something of his life and ministry. Before we get to that, I want to give you some general reflections on the tabernacle. It needs a lot of introduction. Otherwise, just saying that this fits there and did that is not going to make any sense. The first thing is that the tabernacle was a temporary appointment. The final place that God lived among his chosen people in the Old Testament was the temple that was built by Solomon. But the tabernacle was merely a tent uh, among a people who were living in tents in a wilderness. So the tabernacle could actually travel as the people traveled. And the tabernacle stayed with them all the way to the promised land. This is very important because you know that this journey represents the spiritual journey of the whole human race and that the promised land represents heaven. And Jesus told us in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth that you must live, and I am the life that you must live as well. As I've said before, the tabernacle foreshadowed the incarnation of the Son of God. When you look at Jesus' life, he lived among us a very short time. And during that time, St. Matthew uh, chapter 8 tells us that he had no place to lay his head. He was a, a constant traveler. He never stopped traveling. He traveled to every part of the Holy Land because he was trying to set up a new people of God who would begin a new journey on a higher plane to go to the Promised Land, the true and final Promised Land in heaven. And so Jesus was the tent of meeting because people met God in him and God came to them through him. He was the word of God. They had the words of God through the prophets before, but this time it was from himself. It was amazing. So the tabernacle was designed for the wilderness. It wasn't designed for anything else. And once Israel entered and conquered the promised land, the people set up a more permanent shrine, first of all at Bethel and then at Shiloh. And then a couple of centuries later, in the 10th century before Christ, Solomon actually built a temple which was utterly magnificent. So the tabernacle was God's plan to journey with his people so that 
we would never get lost in the wilderness of this world, that we would always have him with us. And if you look at the fulfillment of this in Jesus, he came on the earth through a borrowed cradle and left the earth in a borrowed tomb. And he never owned anything. And he traveled incessantly among the people. He was a man on a journey. He was a pilgrim on this earth. And so he has enabled the entire human race to pick up, stand up, and start this spiritual journey back to God. You'll find that in Hebrews 11, uh, verses 14 to 16. So we discover at the end of the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers that the people of Israel used the tabernacle for less than 40 years. And we find in the fulfillment that Jesus was on the earth less than 40 years as well. And he was literally uh, tabernacling uh, and walking with us and he still walks and tabernacles with us spiritually on our journey. The next point is that if you look at the tabernacle on the outside, it looked poor and humble and unattractive. So a stranger would not know that inside of that tabernacle was the glory of God, that God was actually present. It was exactly the same with Jesus. As he traveled around Israel during his lifetime, he looked poor and humble, and he was unattractive to the rich and the mighty. And inside of him, all the glory of God dwelt. You find that in Colossians 2, 9, in his body dwelt the divinity. Uh, you have Philippians 2, chapters 6 to 11, where his state was divine, but he did not cling to equality with God. He left all of that. He came among us. He was even humbler than us, accepting death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him. So there is the humbling and there's the exaltation. Now, the tabernacle in the wilderness, while it was humble and unattractive, when you go to the temple that Solomon built a couple of centuries later, he spared no money in order to raise a temple that would glorify God. He built an absolutely extraordinary temple, which was one of the wonders of the world for God's permanent home. And so we find too, that in the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus returns to reign on the earth in kingly glory, that he also will have immense glory with him. So even though the tabernacle was so humble and poor and unattractive, God was hidden in the Holy of Holies. Also inside of the young man that walked all over Israel, healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding them and walking on water and doing all the other stuff and teaching them, was hidden all the glory of God as well. Now that's leading to something in the future uh, for them, but it is a reality for us that what Jesus did for us was to make us a temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know you not that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So the reality that is spoken about here in the tabernacle is leading to the most extraordinary reality for us. And it's, it's necessary for us to know where this whole thing actually started. The presence of God, which is called the glory or the Shekinah, it manifested on the mercy seat. Now you'll hear a lot more about this when I describe each of the individual pieces of furniture. He manifested on the mercy seat between the two cherubim. So the mercy seat was actually God's throne on the earth. And a throne is something where a king sits and reigns. He reigned on the earth and it is from this position that for the next 40 years, God taught his people, he guided them, he corrected them, he chastised them, he loved them, he forgave them, absolutely everything. He accepted whatever form of worship they were actually capable of giving him. Just as now Jesus is living in glory on the throne of God and 
From there, he is guiding and teaching and correcting and loving and forgiving his people, the church. So it's actually quite important to see the, the connection between them. While he was on earth, Jesus actually was God's mercy seat. Because you just read the gospel even superficially and everybody who had a need and was open to receiving uh, from God, Jesus just lavished grace and blessing and glory upon them all. And in some cases you're told that the whole crowd, he would just simply say, be healed to the whole lot of them. If a person wasn't healed, it was just simply that they weren't open to it. And it's very, very clear that Jesus had extraordinary mercy on anybody who repented. Just take Matthew, for example, Mary of Magdala, for example, Zacchaeus as an example, and they're just three out of many. If they repented and changed their way of living, yes, he did extraordinary things for them. And he showed extraordinary mercy to the sick, the dying and raising the dead and so on. He literally was the mercy seat for us. So because of that, you can call our Blessed Mother, Mother of Mercy, because she is the mother of him who is the mercy of God. And when you read the Gospel as well, you realise that Jesus revealed God's presence uh, to those who opened up to him, but he hid God's presence from all unbelievers, and that still happens today as well. Now, we've seen this already in the story of the Exodus, that because Moses was open to God, he had this very deep relationship with God that God revealed his secrets to him. But there were others who were in rebellion against God and didn't seem to understand what was going on. Our rebellion against God actually causes spiritual blindness, so we cannot see. It causes spiritual deafness so that we cannot hear, and it hardens our hearts so that we cannot understand. And this is what Isaiah was taught in chapter 6 when he saw the glory of God in the temple, that the people were blind and deaf and dumb and hardened of hearts. So you go to the gospel, and what were the miracles Jesus did? He opened the eyes of the blind, unstopped the ears of the deaf, loosened their tongues, and healed their sicknesses and forgave their sins. So that was to open up the human race to be able to receive him. So there's a huge connection between the tabernacle and Jesus that you may not have even considered before. Jesus didn't show his glory to everyone while he was on the earth, but he did show it to three of the apostles on Mount Tabor. And they had this extraordinary experience of him. And both Peter and John actually spoke about this uh, later on. In other words, breaking through to the reality of what is on the inside. Now, you and I cannot break through to the realities of what is on the inside unless we enter into that deep relationship with God. You can't just do it. When you read John's Gospel, he says that he was with God from the beginning. He was God. He actually presents Jesus as God from the very beginning of his gospel. He's very, very clear about it. And he's very clear at the beginning of the first letter of John as well. I'm going to let you read that yourself. But John 1.14 reads, the word was made flesh. That is the divine logos became sarx. There's an infinite difference between the two. He pitched his tent among us. In other words, he tabernacled. And we saw his glory. Eventually, they should have written the word eventually, because they didn't see it immediately. The glory that was his is the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. Saint Peter was very eloquent in what he said as well. This is 2 Peter uh, 1 verses 16 to 18. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's penetrating the glory. For we received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this that came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, I give you that from the New Testament. If you go from Exodus to the book of Numbers, which is the next one that needs to be done, you will find that God speaks to them from the tabernacle and God defends 
Moses, even to Aaron and Miriam. He absolutely defends them. That's chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. So God spoke to those who broke through to that very special place of union with him. And the the final one I want to share with you is, it's very beautiful. It's uh, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1 and verse 3. He is the radiant light of God's glory and the perfect copy of his nature, sustaining the universe by his perfect command. So what I'm trying to do is just simply to tell you that everything about the tabernacle in the wilderness is not lost in the Old Testament at all. It has a glorious fulfillment in Christ and through him has a glorious fulfillment in the church and forever. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach dailiv. Goodbye. God bless you. Ten years of sharing the peace of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.